Well, let's open the Word of God again, would you please, to the book of Ephesians, to Ephesians chapter number 6. And we've come again to this very famous portion of Scripture on spiritual warfare to get a fresh glimpse of our great need at this hour. I alluded to this earlier on this Lord's Day, but the spiritual conflict has always been raging. It's raged since the Garden of Eden. No, it's raged since before the Garden of Eden. Because somewhere in uh, history past, before time, Satan himself rebelled against God Almighty, was cast out of heaven. That's when the conflict started. Uh, that is when this morning star, this bright shining angel that had been near the throne became God's arch enemy, the adversary of the Lord and all that God is doing. And then, of course, it began in human history in the Garden of Eden when he, the serpent struck at Adam and Eve for the first time. And he wasn't striking at Adam and Eve. He was striking at God. Do you understand that? You ever wonder why the devil wants you? You ever wonder why the devil wants to damn the souls of men or destroy a family or divide a church? Is it really because we're that important? I mean, think about that for just a second. Are we really so important that the devil would want us? The answer to that is no. It is not that we are important. It is that we are important to God. The devil doesn't want to just hurt you. We're pawns, you see. The devil wants to strike at you and in doing so hurt the heart of a God who loved you so much he gave his son for your sins. Think of that just a moment. Let me give you a different perspective on sin in your life. You'll hate sin more when you realize how the devil uses it against God to hurt God. It is not just about us. And since the Garden of Eden, that old serpent, the devil, just keeps striking, striking, striking all the time. So when we come to Ephesians chapter number 6, we're learning a number of things. We looked first at the battlefield this morning just to get the lay of the land of this spiritual conflict. And then we learned something about the spiritual armor and putting on Jesus. Tonight, I want us to meet the enemy. Now, before we read and before I start, when I say those words, meet the enemy, somebody's probably thinking, oh, I was hoping for an encouraging message tonight. But I want you to know when we're done, you should be most encouraged because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So look with me, please, again. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I have, from time to time, been, been tempted to spend my time in verse number 12 defining each of these and talking about what is a principality and power and all of that. But would you notice something very interesting? What's the last word of verse number 11? The devil. And I say to you, everything in verse 12 grows out of the last part of verse number 11. If you follow all this wickedness in our world back upstream, it finds its origin with the devil. Somebody said, where did all this hatefulness come from? I can answer it for you. The devil. All this violence, the devil. Every Rape, every murder, every crime, every war, everything we're dealing with on planet earth at this moment had its origin in Satan's rebellion that then became man's rebellion and it invaded the mainstream of humanity. Every wicked thing began with God's enemy, the devil. So you can blame anybody you want to blame and you can fuss about anything you want to fuss about but if you look beyond, behind all of that, who's pulling the strings? Who's, who's moving the pieces around? Who's, who's launching these strategic attacks? The answer to that is the devil. And, and for the record, let me just throw this in for good measure. The, I be personally believe the reason the spiritual warfare has intensified in recent days. How many of you know it's intensified? I mean, look, look around you. Listen to the news. Watch what's going on in the world. And traveling every week, different regions of the country, I've never seen it like this. Never. Everywhere I go, churches are engaged in it. Families are engaged in it. Preachers are engaged in it. Every spiritually discerning person knows there is a warfare going on right now. So why has it so intensified? Here's what I believe. The battle is always hottest right before it's over. I believe the devil 
is stirring up all the mess he can right now because he's frantic. He sees his window is closing. He knows it's almost over. And I want to say to you tonight, that encourages me. Because when you see all these prophetic things happening and all the pieces coming into place, that's not the time for God's people to tremble. That's to the time for God's people to rejoice and know, friends, we're on the winning side and the captain of our salvation is about to return. So we're dealing with the wiles of the devil. Read on, verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I want you to take your pen tonight and mark two phrases, if you will. At the end of verse number 11, I'd like for you to mark this phrase, able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then the last phrase of verse number 16, able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Near the beginning of this passage and now near the end, like bookends on this spiritual armor and spiritual warfare section, God identifies for us something about our great enemy. And may I just say to you tonight as we begin this study, don't be shocked when the devil gets mad. When good things are going on, look, we, we saw people saved this morning. How many of you are glad we saw people saved today? <laughs> Amen for that. But watch now. When people are coming to God, Satan hates that. Everything that lifts up Jesus enrages Satan. Everything that brings God glory, the devil hates. Everything God ordains, Satan opposes. Look, God made birds. What did Satan do? Nothing. God made trees, and what did Satan do? As far as we know, nothing. God made the animals. Read it for yourself in Genesis, and tell me, please, what did Lucifer do? And the answer is nothing but God made man, gave him the particular capacity to fellowship with his creator, and immediately Satan went to work. I say to you again, the devil from the beginning has been doing everything he could to come between God and man. Let me just give you an illustration or two. Hold your place here in Ephesians. We're coming right back. Go back with me to the Old Testament book of Daniel for just a minute. You know the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel is a book filled with prophecy and filled with prayer. And in Daniel 10, there's a most interesting little section that I hope you'll, you'll go back and study on your own time. Daniel's been praying for something. Uh, we all have things on our hearts, don't we? Things we're praying for, people we're praying for. How many of you have something or someone you're praying for now? Let me ask you a different way. How many of you have something you've been praying for for a while and you haven't seen the answer yet? All right, let me give you a little encouragement. Look at Daniel 10. And verse number 12, Daniel's been praying for a while, not getting the answer. Finally, an angel shows up with the answer. And look at Daniel 10, verse 12. Then said he unto me, fear not, Daniel. Isn't it great when God says fear not? In a world filled with fear, fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Oh, this is good. This is really good. God hears your words when you pray. And God even said to the angel, when you get there, I want you to tell Daniel, I heard him when he started praying. He heard the first words. He heard it when you first began to intercede. So what stopped it? Look at verse number 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which in the book of Daniel, in these prophetical books, is a reference to Satan. The prince of the kings of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. The angel, God's mighty angel, said, I was on the way. I was bringing the answer. I was bringing the message from heaven, and the devil stood in my way, and the devil withstood me. Don't you know if the devil's trying to stop the angels, he sure is trying to stop the church. And yet that's not the end of the story. No, the end of the story is, hallelujah, God sent reinforcements. And Michael the archangel showed up, and they had a spiritual breakthrough of some type, 
And the battle was won and the answer came. May I say to you, keep on praying, friends, the answer's on the way. God is at work in the midst of spiritual conflict. By the way, spiritual warfare takes place most in prayer places. If you want to know where real spiritual conflict takes place, it doesn't just happen on a platform with a preacher preaching. It happens in a prayer closet where people are seeking God. Let me show you again. Keep turning in your Old Testament. Come over to the book of Zechariah for just a moment. Now, there's a book we don't go to very often. I promise you it's in your Bible. It's in there. It's where the pages still stick together, all right? Near the end of the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah. Look at Zechariah chapter 3 and verse number 1. Here's another holy man of God seeking the Lord. Zechariah 3 verse 1, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Doesn't the devil always show up at the most holy moments? I never cease to be amazed how when there are spiritual stirrings, the devil pokes his ugly head up. It's like playing whack-a-mole. You understand what I'm talking about? He just keeps popping up and using anything he possibly can. And by the way, he'll use anybody. Don't let him use you. He'll, he'll sneak in anywhere. Don't let him sneak in in your heart and in your home. And so here's Joshua the high priest, and he's come to the holy place to pray, and the devil's standing right there in the place of the adversary, the accuser. Do you, do you know that's what the word devil means? That's exactly what the word devil means, accuser. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. He will accuse you to God. He'll accuse God to you. He'll accuse you to others. He'll accuse others to you. My suggestion, stop listening to the devil. He's a liar and the father of it. You can't believe him, and you can't win any argument with him, so just stop having a conversation with him altogether. When he starts whispering in your ear, just say, that's enough of that, and turn to the God of truth instead of the devil of lies. And, and may I just say this as a little footnote before we read on. The devil does a real good job being the accuser of the brethren. He doesn't need any help in that department. So don't come alongside and become another accuser of the brethren. When you do, you become one of the devil's mouthpieces. Oh, but look at verse 2. And the Lord said unto Satan. Whew. I just want to stop and say, Lord, thank you for speaking up for me. There are moments when you don't know what to say. And even if you could say something, you couldn't say the right thing, but aren't you glad the Lord speaks? And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? I love that. Here's the scene. Joshua the high priest comes in to pray, and Satan's standing right there with his bony finger pointing at him and saying, You don't deserve to be here, and you're a sinner. You're not worthy of getting your prayers answered. By the way, all oh, that's true of every one of us. The Lord Jesus stands up, points to Joshua and says, this one belongs to me. He's a brand plucked out of the fire. Can I tell you, that's my testimony tonight. I'm a black-hearted, hell-deserving sinner. I deserve to be in hell tonight. But I'm not in hell and I'm never going to hell because I'm a brand plucked out of the fire. God saved me, washed me from my sins in his own blood and gave me eternal life. I belong to him. He belongs to me. So watch it, please. When the spiritual warfare comes, what must I go back to? I must go back to what I know for sure, and that is the Lord is with me. And he says, the Lord rebuke the old Satan. Let me give you one more. Turn over to the end of your Bible just for a moment. Come to the book of Jude. Here's an interesting one. Now you think it's a New Testament reference, but it's actually an Old Testament story in New Testament Scripture. Look at the book of Jude for just a moment. Verse number 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. That sounds a lot like Zechariah, doesn't it? It's the only conversation you should ever have with the devil. You ready? The Lord rebuke you. You plead the blood of Jesus, you speak the name of Christ, and you go right on. Don't listen to him. Don't talk with him. You can't outwit him and you can't outreason him. Just say the Lord rebuke thee and leave the devil in God's hands. Let God take care of your devil. But here's what I want you to see. Even the archangel had a problem with him. You talk about power. Michael the archangel is in a combat with the devil. And what is he fighting over? Look at it. Verse number 9. What's he fighting over? The body of who? 
Moses. You remember Moses. Moses, the man of God. Moses who led the children of Israel through the desert. Moses that had God's mighty power on him. Moses was engaged in spiritual conflict all the days of his life. Do you know when the conflict ended? For him, it didn't end until he died. And even after he died, get this, the devil was still trying to get his body. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? All the way to the very end, Satan was fighting him. I remember years ago, we were in, we were in Amman, Jordan, and the Jordanian pastor that was hosting us drove me up on Mount Pisgah. He drove me up to Nebo. And we got out and looked across the desert where the children of Israel had wandered and looked over into the promised land. And he said, somewhere, right in here, somewhere, Moses died looking over into the promised land. That was, that was a sobering thing for me to stand there on that mountain range and look out and see Israel in the distance. And the Bible says, nobody knows the place of his burial to this day. Now, the Greek Orthodox, they know where he's buried. And they charge you about $10 a head to see his burial place. But other than them, nobody knows where he's buried. Now, why did God bury him? Because God knew the devil was going to be, even after his body to the very end, try to use it in some way against the children of Israel, set it up as an idol or desecrated or whatever the case may be. Do you understand that the spiritual conflict we're engaged in is going to be a reality until the day we see the Lord Jesus Christ? If Jesus fought the devil in the wilderness, you can be sure you're going to have a devil to fight too. If Satan desired to have Simon Peter that he might sift him as wheat, you can be sure that the devil wants you and your family as well. So what are you going to do about the enemy? Well, let's go back to Ephesians 6, and let me give you some simple truths tonight. I want you to write them down again. All from our text here, what do we learn about our enemy that will help us? Well, first of all, I want you to see our enemy's defiance. He is a defiant enemy. Notice what the Bible says. And at the end of verse number 16, to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And I want you to circle the word wicked in your Bible. The word here literally references a wicked one, a wicked person. There are many wicked things, but the devil is the wicked one. It's a reference to his nature. It is who he is. You ever wonder why the devil does what he does? Because he is who he is. Do you know why he wants to put to death? Because he's a murderer. Do you know why he lies? Because he's a liar. Do you know why he wants to destroy? Because he is a destroyer. That's who he is. He is, watch this, the antithesis of everything our God is. If you took all these good things that we talked about being true of Jesus and then find out the opposite, that's what the devil is. So if Jesus is the truth, Satan is a lie. If Jesus is righteousness, Satan is iniquity. If Jesus is peace, then Satan is war. You understand? If Jesus is good news, Satan's bad news. Every good thing you find in Christ, the devil offers you the exact opposite. Now listen to me with your heart. You must choose which one you're going to follow. You must choose which one you're going to listen to. This is not some fairy tale, some figment of the imagination, something I, I came up with or just wanted to talk to you about tonight. This is the reality. Every one of us is going to give ear and going to give life to someone's cause, and I don't know about you, I don't want to give one inch to the devil in my life. I want to take all the enemy territory I can and live under the ruling presence of Jesus Christ. So number one, we see the enemy's defiance. Number two, as you write this down, we see the enemy's desire. What is his desire? Well, look at verse 16 again. If you back up from the wicked, the wicked is using something. He's using fiery darts. In ancient warfare, they would take arrows cover them in pitch, set them on fire, and launch them into the camp with the idea of setting things on fire. Now, I tell you that everything Satan launches is set on fire of hell, but his objective is one objective, and that is he wants to destroy and consume everything he possibly can. God is a giver, and the devil is a taker. What does fire do? It consumes. It burns up. It, it makes to disappear. The wildfires, terrible wildfires burning in the western part of our country right now. You watch those wildfires, the most beautiful forest land, the most beautiful mountains, the most beautiful picturesque landscape, and the fire comes raging through. 
In a moment, it consumes everything. May I tell you, when you give the devil a little room in your mind, you give him a little room in your life, you give him a little room in your relationships, he will in a moment of time rob from you and steal from you every good thing that God has tried to put into your life. What is his desire? He wants everything. Remember I said to you earlier this morning from chapter 4, neither give place to the devil. And I said, he doesn't deserve any place. I want you to know he'll take any place you give him and he'll destroy everything he touches. Let me show you something. Hold your place here. Turn over to the book of Peter with me for just a moment. 1 Peter chapter 5. Now you know this passage, but put your eyes on it for just a moment. 1 Peter 5 verse 7 is a great verse. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Anybody else glad he cares for you tonight? Jesus cares. But the great contrast of God's care is Satan's consumption. Look at verse number 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may. What's that word, church? Do you know what the word devour there means? It literally means to make disappear. Just poof, it's gone. You say, the devil can't do that. Really? Because I know families, good families, that have disappeared. I know people that sat in seats just like this, in good churches, who listen to the right kind of Bible preaching every week, who have disappeared. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. I want you to know something. Far, far, far better preachers than I have disappeared. And I fear. I, look, I'm, I'm talking to you from my heart tonight. I fear. Would you pray for me? I don't want to be one of those that becomes a casualty in this warfare. I, I don't want the devil to devour. I, I'm thinking now of my children. The most precious thing I have on earth outside Jesus and my wife are the precious children God has given to us. And I know something. I know the devil would love to devour Morgan's life. I know he'd love to devour Lauren's life, devour Grant's life, every good thing. Just eat it up, gobble it up, consume it. Why? Because that's who he is. That's his desire. That's his intent and his design on your life. This is not a game. This is not a joke. This is not something we just say, oh, yeah, we believe that. No, friend, be sober, be vigilant, get on guard. My pastor used to say, the devil, this old roaring lion will walk past the cage door of your life a thousand days to find it cracked open one day. And so there must be a constant vigilance. We rest in verse 7, but we stay alert in verse 8. And then notice verse 9, whom resist steadfast in the faith. Somebody says, I don't know how we're going to get through this. I don't know how we're going to be victorious over our adversary, the devil. Look at verse 9. Hey, look, God doesn't just tell you what's against you. He tells you what's for you. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Go back to Ephesians 6 and look at Ephesians 6, verse 16. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Do you see how the shield of faith, the resisting of faith, is the only thing that will cause you to be victorious over the wicked one? So we see the enemy's defiance, the enemy's desire. Number three, I want you to see the enemy's deceit. He's a sneaky little booger, let me tell you. He's deceitful. He's a liar from the beginning. Sin is a lie. It promises what it can never fulfill. Back up to verse number 11. The Bible says the wiles of the devil. Now, I'm dating myself a little bit here, but how many of you remember Wiley Coyote? I'm just curious. You remember Wiley Coyote. He was a wily thing, wasn't he? Always sneaky and conniving and deceiving and coming around the other side. May I tell you, that's exactly what the devil does. Did you know the devil knows you? Sure he does. Now, the devil is, is probably the, the greatest investigator that's ever lived because he studies the lives of believers to find some way to trip them up. What's true of you is not necessarily true of me. What he uses for me is not necessarily what he'll use for you. But the devil is going to use some weapon against you. I'm thinking now that verse, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. How is that possible? Watch this. Because not only does he have weapons, praise God, we have weapons. And that's what Ephesians 6 shows us. But his weapons, he doesn't fight fair. Let's go back to Corinthians just for a second. Let me show you some scriptures. Stay with me just a minute. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. The apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. 
He had a lot to say about the devil. Look at 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. How does he get the advantage of us? Now look at the end of the verse. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Do you understand how the devil works? Are we really that ignorant? I mean, excuse me, that's the Bible word. Are we really that ignorant? Watch, please. We open our eyes, our ears, our minds, our hearts, and our homes with so little thought of what we're letting in. In this particular text that we're studying right now, this particular text, it's all about bitterness, forgiveness, and the lack thereof. You know, Paul is saying, do you understand that when you let a little root of bitterness into your life, when you let, let, let anger unchecked, when you let for unforgiveness fester in your soul like a cancer, do you understand that the devil at that moment is using one of his devices on you? He hadn't changed his instruments from the beginning of time. And yet we live our lives so oblivious to the spiritual warfare going on around us. You know why I'm preaching this this week? I'm praying this week, oh God, give us a spiritual awakening. Give us a fresh glimpse of God and the devil and the spiritual conflict and what's going on in this world and our place in it. We are not ignorant of his devices. Come on over in 2 Corinthians since we're there. Come on over to chapter 10 for a moment. Powerful text. I was meditating on this yesterday. It begins with Jesus, the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I love that. Look at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Look at this powerful parenthesis of verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Did you know that outside the ancient city of Corinth, there was a castle on a hill? There was an ancient castle outside the city of Corinth up on a mountain, it was very visible, and it was known to be a place when if there was ever a military invasion, a battle, the residents of Corinth could run to that fortress, to that castle, and they could hide there. It was a place of refuge. I personally believe Paul was using this under inspiration of the Holy Spirit as an object lesson to them. He was saying, look, please, there's something in your life that has become a carnal castle, a fleshly fort. It's become Satan's stronghold in your life. It is the thing you run to when you should be running to Jesus. And I'm going to tell you what you're going to have to do. You're going to tear it down. In fact, I've marked in my Bible the word down. Can I tell you? You can never build up until you tear down. There is no construction without demolition. You say you want to grow? You say you want your family to grow? You say you want to go to the next level as a church? Then we're going to have to tear some things out. And that's painful. We're going to have to let God rip out of us the things that dishonor Jesus and, and rob glory from God. Oh, tear down everything that takes the place only Jesus should have. And look at verse 5, casting down imaginations. Where does it start? In the mind. Isn't that really where the battle is won or lost? In the mind. So many people right now paralyzed by fear, just paralyzed by fear. Pardon me, so many Christians living in worry instead of in faith. I'm going to tell you what you got to do. You're going to have to take that by the throat and say, that doesn't belong in the thought life of a believer. I'm tearing that down, and I'm giving that to Jesus Christ. Lust finds a foothold in the life of a believer. Pride finds a foothold in the life of a believer, in the imaginations, in the thought life. Oh, God, give us some spiritual breakthrough and victory this week in the secret places of our life because only there can we find the victory that Christ has for us. Look at the end of verse number 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I love it. He says, let's take the enemy and let's make the enemy become the captive to Jesus. Did it ever dawn on you that that area of your life that keeps tripping you up could become the greatest victory you've ever had? 
Did it ever dawn on you that that thing that you are struggling with at this moment and the devil keeps lying to you and saying, see, that's just the way you are. You're never going to get victory over that. Did it ever dawn on you that that very thing may be the greatest spiritual victory you ever have and it may be the trophy of grace that Jesus most wants in your life? Do you understand how God takes the enemy and turns it around for his own glory and his own honor? Come on over across the page. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Everybody look at 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. What a contrast. The subtlety of the devil and the simplicity of Jesus. <laughs> on one hand, confusion, chaos, and complication. And on the other hand, just beautiful, glorious simplicity. Which one you want for your life? Jesus simplifies everything and the devil complicates everything. But look at the verse. The subtlety. The subtlety that Satan used. What is that? That's his deceit. That is the wiles of the devil. And I, I'm slowing down on purpose here because I'm wanting you to think. How's the devil tricking you right now? What lies he been feeding you? What is the thing that doesn't line up with truth and line up with the nature and character of Jesus and line up with God's perfect will for your life? What is the thing that the devil keeps saying to you and you keep believing it? What is that thing? I want you to know, if you're ever going to live in victory, you're going to have to face that lie with the truth that God says in His Word. Let me give you one more. Go back to Ephesians 6 and let me show you the great truth. Because Ephesians 6 not only shows us the enemy's defiance and desire and deceit, but number four, praise the Lord, it shows us the enemy's defeat. Did you notice the first word I had you mark in verse 11 and the first word I had you mark in verse 16? It's the same word. It is the word what? Abel. I, wait a minute now, I'm not able, but let me tell you who's able. God's able. And watch, the Lord will make us able. Look at verse 11 again. Able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Oh, this is glorious. There's hope. You don't have to fall. You can stand. We've heard about so many tragic moral failings and fallings in recent days. Every time I hear it, I, I tremble and I grieve. Oh, but I run to this and I say, Oh, Lord, I believe in the words of Jude. Thou art able to keep me from falling and present me faultless before your presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica and said, I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just tell you, we're too near the end of this battle now. I don't want to quit before the Lord Jesus wins the eventual victory. I want to see all that God has for me. Brethren, sisters, let's pray for one another. We're in this thing together with the Lord. What do we need? We need to see the Lord defeat our enemy. Look down to verse number 16. Not only able to stand, but able to quench. Is the fire real? Oh, yes. But God says, I can put the fire out. Is Satan's attack brutal at times? Oh, yes. But God is able to help you withstand all of that. You see, I'm glad to report to you tonight that though you have an enemy, you work for the victor. Genesis chapter 3, we find the first promise of Messiah. Genesis 3 verse 15. It's when God looked the devil in the face. He was a, channeling through a snake, of course. Satan was. And God looked that serpent in the face and said, I'm going to send a seed, the seed of a woman, and you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. How many of you ever had a heel bruise? It's painful, isn't it? Seriously, you ever have a heel bruise? I mean, just for a few days, you kind of limp around. And, oh, you wince when you, when you put weight on it. But let me ask you a question. Is a heel bruise fatal, yes or no? Now, last time I checked, you're going to live through it. 
Let me ask you a question. What about a head wound? Can it be fatal? And God looked at the devil and said, you're going to bruise the heel of the seed of the woman when he comes, but he's going to turn around and he's going to bruise your head. Oh, I like this. At Calvary, Satan struck at the lovely Son of God and he bruised him there. Oh, yes, he did. He bruised him at Calvary. But three days later, when Jesus Christ came out of that grave alive forevermore, he planted his foot squarely on the head of that old serpent, the devil. He came out of there with the keys to death, hell and the grave in his hand, and Jesus Christ is the victor tonight, and I am more than conqueror through Jesus Christ. So Satan was first defeated when Christ came the first time. That's not all. He'll be fully defeated when Christ comes the second time. Turn back to Romans 16 just for a second real quick. Look at Romans 16. And I love this verse, verse number 20. It says, and the God of peace. Aren't you glad we serve the God of peace? The God of peace shall bruise Satan under, what's it say? Your feet shortly. I like that word. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now watch, Genesis 3.15, he's already bruised under Jesus' feet, but very shortly he's going to be bruised under whose feet? Ours. Let me ask you a question. Stay with me now. How does the devil get bruised under our feet? You ready for this? Only if we're seated with Jesus. And when our Lord comes again, we're going to be with him. Anybody else looking forward to that day? And the devil's going to finally be shut up forever. Praise God for that. And the accuser will have nothing else to say and no more lies to tell. And on that day, he will not only be defeated under Christ's feet, he will be defeated under our feet because we are on the winning side. But we must live between the first and the second. And I came to say to you tonight, no matter what the devil's throwing at you right now, no matter what you're dealing with, and it's different for everybody in this room, some of you right now, it's, it's emotional. Some of you, it's some circumstantial thing. Some of you, it's physical. Some of you, it's spiritual. In a sense, it's all spiritual, but the devil comes at us from different angles, his wiles, you see, his weapons. But I want to tell you tonight that God Almighty is able to give you victory over the enemy, not just someday, but thank God today. You don't have to wait to go to heaven to be on the winning side. You can be on the winning side tonight. I was meditating on this this afternoon. And you start talking about the devil. It's very easy to get down thinking about, oh, the devil. Yeah, the devil. And then I had this wonderful thought. You have to know the devil because you've got to know your enemy. You can't find an enemy you don't know. And in a real sense, you've got to not only know the devil, you've got to know yourself because you've got to know what area of your life he's going to try to slip in through. And now over time, you learn yourself that way. But may I tell you the greatest thing you need to know? You don't just need to know your devil and know your flesh. You need to know your God. Because the more you know about your God, the more confidence you will have that God is greater than any fiery dart the devil throws at you. How many of you are singing Christmas songs already? I'm just curious. Anybody singing Christmas songs already? Yeah, I knew there'd be two or three. There is in every church. These are the crazy people. I want you to know that. They're already playing Christmas carols around the house. It's still 90 degrees outside, and they're already singing Christmas carols. This afternoon, I had a Christmas carol come to my mind. Forgive me. Would you forgive me? Because this Christmas carol is not just any Christmas carol. It's one of the greatest doctrinal songs ever written. It was written by Charles Wesley. And typically, we sing the first three verses. They're the most famous verses. But there was a fourth verse that Charles Wesley wrote to hark the herald angel sings. And it goes like this. Come, desire of nations, come. Fix in us thy humble home. And then here's the phrase. Rise the woman's conquering seed, bruise in us the serpent's head. You ever sang those words? Bruise in us the serpent's head. And this is wonderful. Somebody says, well, how does Satan get bruised in my life? I'm going to tell you. You ready? Every time you let Jesus win a victory in your life, it's a defeat against the devil in your life. Every answer to prayer. Every temptation resisted, every faithful witness given, everything utterly yielded and surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, every victory in me 
bruises again the head of that old serpent, the devil. Would you like to be a part of defeating the devil? Let me tell you how to defeat the devil. Let Christ rule and reign in every area of your life. You can't conquer the devil, but you can let Christ conquer you. And when Christ conquers you, he'll defeat your enemy.